Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Lomi, Professor of Ethnic Studies here at UC Berkeley. Welcome to today's timely and important talk on critical race theory, sponsored by the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Cal. This is the second presentation in Ollie's series, America's Unfinished Work. The series brings leading voices from the campus and in the community to engage in an examination and, er and hopefully eradication of systemic racism in order to create a more humane, just, and equal society. Now, I would argue that most Americans didn't even know what critical race theory was, but President Trump seems to consider it more of a threat than the COVID-19 pandemic. Consider his remarks three weeks ago at the White House Conference on American History. I quote, students in our universities are inundated with critical race theory. This is a Marxist doctrine holding that America is a wicked and racist nation. Critical race theory is being forced into our children's schools. It's being imposed into our workplace trainings and it's being deployed to rip apart friends, neighbors, and families, end of quote. Pretty powerful stuff. And today, Professor Chiara Bridges is going to help us sort out what critical race theory actually is and what it isn't. Chiara M. Bridges is a professor of law at the UC Berkeley School of Law, and she has written extensively, including three books on issues of race, class, reproductive rights, and the intersection of the three. She graduated as a valedictorian at Spelman College. She received her JD from the Columbia Law School and a PhD with distinction in anthropology from Columbia University. Professor Bridges also speaks fluent Spanish and basic Arabic, and she is a classically trained ballet dancer. As Ali director Susan Hoffman said to me, Professor Bridges is just your basic underachiever. She'll be presenting, and then after that, you can add questions in the chat, and she will, she will uh, take up those questions at the end of her talk. So without further ado, it's, I'm extremely pleased to introduce Professor Kiara Bridges. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction, Professor Omi. Um, I am so honored to uh, be here with uh, the community today. I am so honored um, to have the opportunity to um, uh, explain or talk about critical race theory, um, as well as to apply it to some current events. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we can get started. Okay, so my remarks today will examine two contexts in which institutional or structural racism has shortened the lives of people of color, specifically black people. And those two contexts are policing and health policy. Specifically, I will explain what critical race theory as an analytical framework brings to understanding police brutality as well as racial disparities in health. So the plan for the next hour, we will explore how systemic racism kills in the context of policing, We'll explore how systemic racism kills in the context of health policy. And then we will have time to engage in a question and answer portion. Um, and so to that uh, end, um, the, the chat function um, will be uh, the avenue for you to place your questions to me. Um, and so if you drop your questions in the chat um, during the Q&A at the end of my presentation, I will turn to answering them. So let's start with policing. And more precisely, I wanna start with the question of how critical race theory, or CRT for short, might encourage us to think about George Floyd's death um, earlier this summer. Now, there is no time for me to give a complete history of CRT. It is not possible to describe the framework concisely or pithily, um, though Trump tried to do so. Um, I will just say that CRT emerged in the legal academy in the 1970s and 1980s in response to what critical scholars considered to be the limitations in traditional civil rights dis discourse, the limitations of the traditional way we had come to think about race and racism. One of the many ways that critical race theorists thought that traditional civil rights discourse was limited was with regard to its definition of racism. 
So traditional civil rights uh, discourse tends to define racism as discrete, easily identifiable, invariably intentional, always irrational acts that are perpetrated by bad actors. Essentially, traditional civil rights discourse defines racism as individually held bias or prejudice. CRT proposes that this definition of racism is woefully inadequate. While defining racism as discrete, easily identifiable, invariably intentional, always irrational acts that are perpetrated by bad actors, why that, while that definition might describe a type of racism that was ubiquitous in the pre-civil rights era, and while this definition of racism uh, might describe a type of racism that tenaciously persists today, CRT argues that this definition does not describe the mechanisms that do most of the work of maintaining white people as the dominant racial group in this country at present. CRT contends that far from being discrete or cut off, racism and racial dominance are oftentimes the result of the interactions of many institutions across multiple domains. CRT claims that far from being easily identifiable, racism and the recognition of an act or omission as a species of racism, that frequently requires a theoretical framework to help us figure out which societal choices inflict racial subordination and consequently ought to be designated as racism. CRT proposes that racism is not invariably intentional in the post-civil rights era, racism is oftentimes the unintended, if foreseeable, consequence of choices that we make. CRT also denies that racism is unvaryingly irrational. It posits that more often than not, racism makes all the sense in the world. Finally, CRT argues that while racism may be perpetrated by bad actors, it more frequently is the result of intention, it's institutional structural processes in the post-civil rights era. CRT offers that defining racism in the way that traditional civil rights discourse proposes is problematic and dangerous. When racism is only understood as bias or prejudice practiced by a bad actor, it puts outside of the field of vision all of the institutions, structures, and systems that function to subordinate people of color. With that background, consider the questions that the traditional liberal definition of racism leads us to ask when we learn that George Floyd was killed after police officer Derek Chauvin kneeled on his neck for close to nine minutes. The definition directs our focus to the police officer who killed him, Derek Chauvin, and it guides us to an interrogation of Chauvin and his views on race. So we ask, has Chauvin ever used the N-word? We ask, does Chauvin have any black friends? We asked, does Chauvin listen to hip hop? Essentially, the liberal definition of racism leads us to ask whether Chauvin is a bigot. And if we determine that Chauvin is a bigot, then we can be comfortable concluding that Floyd's death is a manifestation of racism. And if we determine that Chauvin is not, a, in fact, a bigot, then Floyd's death cannot be understood as a manifestation of racism. Notably, there is evidence that Chauvin may not be a bigot. <laughs> He was married to an Asian woman after all. So can a white person be a bigot if he's married to an Asian woman? Can one dislike black people while loving at least one Asian person? Can dislike of black people and love of an Asian person be simultaneous? Please note that these are profoundly uninteresting questions to ask. Now, when racism is defined in the way that CRT proposes, we are encouraged to ask different questions about Floyd's death. When we learned that the police encounter that ended in Floyd's death began because Floyd might have been attempting to use a counterfeit $20 bill at a convenience store, we might remind ourselves of the definition of a white collar crime. White collar crimes are generally understood as nonviolent acts that result in financial harm and that are committed for financial gain. So the crime that Floyd was att allegedly attempting to commit was a white collar crime. Note as well that Eric Garner was allegedly committing a white collar crime minutes before his death. As a reminder, in 2014, Eric Garner was killed after a police officer, Daniel Pantaleo, put him in an illegal chokehold. Pantaleo initiated the encounter that ended in Garner's death, 
because Garner was illegally selling individual cigarettes from a pack. New York State, like many other states, taxes the sale of cigarettes and other tobacco products. New York State collects taxes from the sale of tobacco products by requiring persons who sell these products to register with the New York State Tax Commission and to prepay taxes on the sale of the products through purchasing tax stamps. So when Garner sold a cigarette without a license from the New York State Tax Commission and without the requisite tax stamps, New York State was not able to collect taxes on his sale of the cigarette. So essentially, Pantaleo attempted to arrest Garner because Garner was allegedly engaging in tax evasion, a white collar crime. So again, both George Floyd and Eric Garner were allegedly engaging in white collar crimes before their deaths. And again, white collar crimes are generally understood as nonviolent acts that result in financial harm and are committed for financial gain. CRT encourages us to ask questions about how race informs our definitions of crime. Now, I've been thinking a lot about recessions lately, you might be too. <laughs> In 2007, the country was thrown into the greatest economic downturn that the nation had experienced since the Great Depression of 1929. Just a very brief history of the Great Recession, banks had relaxed their lending practices, giving bigger mortgages to borrowers who had not provided and could not provide proof of their ability to make payments on their mortgages. Financial institutions packaged these mortgages into securities. And when homeowners eventually defaulted on their loans, the value of these mortgage-backed securities plummeted. Banks who owned these securities were unable to raise capital, and they teetered on the verge of collapse until the government bailed them out. Now, the Great Recession was made possible by predatory lending and greed. What I want to highlight here is that the financial practices that led to the Great Recession were nonviolent. They resulted in financial harm, and they certainly were engaged in in order to reap financial gain, but they were not crimes. CRT invites us to ask, how does race and class influence decisions to criminalize some nonviolent harmful practices that are committed for financial gain? CRT invites us to ask, how does race and class influence decisions not to criminalize other nonviolent harmful practices that are committed for financial gain? Why do we decide to simply leave some of these harmful practices to agencies to regulate or not? Further, if Floyd was in fact trying to pay for something with the counterfeit $20 bill, why did he do that? Why had Garner felt compelled to sell single cigarettes from a pack on the sidewalks of Staten Island, New York? What does it reveal about the economic opportunities available or not available to Floyd that he thought that attempting to pay for some goods with a counterfeit bill was worth the risk? What does it reveal about the economic opportunities available or not available to Garner that an able-bodied adult man of sound mind can sell individual cigarettes from a pack something that was worth his time and energy. Also, what empowered Chauvin or any police officer for that matter to engage with Floyd, an individual who was suspected to be engaging in a nonviolent crime? What empowered Pantaleo or any police officer for that matter to engage with Garner, who also was suspected to be engaging in a nonviolent victimless crime? Specifically, why has our constitution been interpreted to give the police the latitude to initiate contact with individuals suspected of engaging in nonviolent crimes? Moreover, when we learn that 46-year-old George Floyd suffered from coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease, health conditions that might have made the knee that Chauvin placed on his neck for close to nine minutes, much more likely to be deadly, we can ask questions about why Floyd had come to inhabit such a state of unhealth. Similarly, when we learn that 43-year-old Eric Garner suffered from a host of health issues, including asthma, that made the illegal chokehold in which Pantaleo put him much more likely to be deadly, we can ask questions about why Garner had come to inhabit such a state of unhealth. Why did Floyd, as well as so many Black people in this country suffer from heart disease? Why did Garner, as well as so many other indigent folks in this country suffer from obesity? Why did Garner, as well as so many other poor people of color, suffer from asthma 
why did Floyd and Garner, as well as so many other Black people, suffer from hypertension? The answers to this batch of questions do not involve malicious, malicious actors, but rather deadly systems and structures. And just a nod to the novel coronavirus, at this point in the U.S.'s encounter with COVID-19, most are aware that the disease has disproportionately killed Black people. I believe that the mortality rates from COVID-19 are twice as high for Black people than they are for white people. And this is true because of racial disparities in health. Because of structural racism, Black people suffer from higher rates of the underlying conditions, the asthma, the hypertension, the heart and lung disease, the diabetes that are risk factors for developing a particularly severe case of COVID-19. In other words, well before their encounters with the police officers who would eventually kill them, Eric Garner and George Floyd's bodies had already been damaged by the structural racism that has made COVID-19 particularly devastating among communities of color. And I will return to racial disparities in health in a bit. So defining racism in the way that the traditional liberal tradition proposes, this allows us from looking at these broader issues. Instead, it keeps our attention squarely focused on the individual police officer who nailed on Floyd's neck for close to nine minutes. It keeps our attention squarely focused on the individual police officer who placed Garner in an illegal chokehold. In this way, we see how the liberal definition of racism suggests that in order to fix any race problem the nation continues to have, no great societal reformation is necessary. Now, <laughs> few, most would argue that there are likely not incredibly large numbers of bigots roaming the streets in the post-civil rights era. Now, of course, bigots exist and they might even occupy positions of power. However, I believe most people across the political spectrum would probably all agree that bigots are still in the minority in our country. Now, if racism is only individually held bias or prejudice, prejudice and if biased or prejudiced individuals are in the minority, then racism is an aberration. And if racism is an aberration, then racial justice will be achieved when these aberrant individuals are identified and denied the ability to harm others. The work of anti-racism then is simply to remove these blemishes from an otherwise perfectly good body politic. But if racism is defined more broadly in the way that CRT proposes, then there is nothing simple, pat, or easy about the work of anti-racism. Let's return to George Floyd. The liberal definition of racism suggests that the work of anti-racism is to remove Chauvin from the police force if he is indeed a bigot. It also suggests that we need to implement procedures that will prevent other bigots from becoming police officers. And if we do those two things, ta-da, problem solved. But if racism is defined in the way that CRT proposes, then more wide range changes are necessary. These changes involve addressing society's decisions to criminalize nonviolent activities in which the poor, because of their indigence, primarily engage, like selling individual cigarettes from a pack. These changes include creating legal opportunities for individuals to support themselves and their families financially. These changes include creating a durable, generous and non-punitive social safety net for those who find it difficult or impossible to be financially self-supporting. These changes involve reconsidering the court's interpretation of the Fourth Amendment's prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures, an interpretation that has empowered police officers to approach and arrest individuals engaging in non-violent victimless crimes. These changes include addressing the siting of environmental hazards in poor communities of color, which contributes to the high rates of health problems among the residents of these communities. These changes include making healthy foods available and affordable in poor neighborhoods. And these changes include tackling the myriad reasons that people of color in this country are sicker and die earlier than their white counterparts, including our two-tier healthcare system and the deadly toll that racism-related stress takes on the bodies of people of color. And so this example reveals that CRT's definition of racism means that anti-racism requires an extensive, and some would say radical, reordering of society 
And my little brain suggests that that is the reason that Trump has decided to attack CRT. <laughs> because we suggest that in order to fix the country's enduring race problem, something that Trump denies, we have to make great changes in the status quo. Okay, now a couple of minutes ago, I said that because of structural racism, black people suffer from higher rates of the underlying conditions, the asthma, the hypertension, the heart and lung disease, the diabetes that are risk factors for developing a particularly severe case of COVID-19. And so I wanna unpack that claim. And in unpacking that claim, I want to examine the second context in which systemic racism kills, and the second context being health policy. Now, researchers have long documented that Black people have higher rates of every major common illness. And I should also mention that there are racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality. Black babies are twice as likely than white babies to die before their first birthdays. And Black women are three to four times as likely as white women to die during pregnancy, childbirth, and shortly thereafter. What explains this? <laughs> so I first want to discuss three popular explanations of racial disparities in health that do not take systemic racism. Three explanations of racial disparities in health that critical race theorists have critiqued. And then I wanna look at explanations of racial disparities in health that do take systemic racism seriously. So let's start with this first one, genes. So critical scholars resoundingly reject the idea that genetic differences between the races explain racial disparities in health. Nevertheless, there is always a study popping up somewhere that offers to explain racial disparities in health in genetic terms. So this is an excerpt um, from an article um, from my former institution, Boston University. Um, in 2012, a group of researchers there um, sought to identify what they called the role of genetics in Black women's experiences with cancer. And as you see, this is a headline from a news story covering their research, genetics can trump income access to care. And here's a little excerpt from the study. And what I wanna draw your attention to um, is this final little piece that says, at all ages, mortality from breast cancer is higher for Black women, and it's clear now that it's not due to differences in access, care, or treatment. And so these researchers are committed to the idea that genetic variation between racial groups explains these elevated breast cancer mortality rates among Black women. The problem is that people who claim that genetic differences between races explain health differences between races have never been able to identify a genetic variation that is specific to a racial group. The failure to identify race-specific genetic variations is due to the fact that such race-specific genetic variations do not exist. <laughs> Researchers who propose that genetic differences are causing racial disparities in health usually reach this conclusion after they have controlled for poten other potential causes of the disparity, like income, socioeconomic status, or access to health insurance and health services. And although these researchers may eliminate many non-genetic causes of any given racial disparity in health outcome, they never identify the genetic cause of the disparity. Their faith that genetic variation between the races exists leads them to presume that such as the genetic cause of the disparity exists. This is precisely what these researchers at BU are attempting to do. They show that if we control for access care treatments, Black women still die at elevated rates from breast cancer. And because of their faith in genetic race or ideas of genetic race, um, they're going to spend tens of millions of dollars looking for the genetic culprit um, that explains these elevated rates of breast cancer mortality. Again, we collectively ought to oppose the claim that genetic variations between the races explain racial health disparities, most prominently because the empirical research cannot support it. One of my favorite people in the world, Dorothy Roberts at UPenn, explains it is implausible that one race of people evolved to have a greater genetic predisposition to heart failure, hypertension, infant mortality, maternal mortality, diabetes, asthma, we might even add COVID-19. <laughs> there is no evolutionary theory that it can explain why African ancestry would be genetically prone to practically every major common illness. 
But we also ought to oppose the claim that racial health disparities can be explained in terms of genetics because they are a dangerous distraction from those mechanisms that actually explain why people of color are sicker and die earlier than their white counterparts. When you're like me and you're convinced that these disparities are caused by structural factors like residential segregation and the unhealthy housing stock found in the neighborhoods that people of color call home, like the clustering of environmental hazards in segregated neighborhoods of color, like high unemployment rates, like the unavailability of quality health services. When you're like me and you believe that these factors are killing black people, then any suggestion that genes are killing black people sounds like an excuse. It sounds like an excuse not to address what really is causing the deaths of black people. So critical race theories rejects the claim that bad genes are causing racial disparities in health. We also reject the claim that culture explains racial disparities in health. Now there is an undeniable, it is undeniable that one's behavior affects one's health. There is a greater likelihood that a person who eats healthy foods and works out every day will have better health outcomes than a person who eats fatty, high sodium foods or drinks sugary beverages and smokes cigarettes and doesn't exercise. However, the undeniable truth that unhealthy behaviors lead to unhealthy outcomes is more problematic when unhealthy behaviors are imagined to constitute a culture that explains racial disparities in health. Differently stated, we ought to be wary of arguments that people of, cultures, uh, people of color's culture leads them to engage in behaviors that compromise their health. One hears cultural explanations of racial disparities in health ever so often. For example, there is an argument that the Tuskegee experiment has led to a culture of distrust of physicians and other healthcare providers among Black Americans. And this culture is thought to have damaging health consequences as it leads Black Americans to refuse to seek medical care when they ought to do so. Another example is the argument that indigenous culture, Native culture, leads the people steeped in it, Native Americans, to consider, to, sorry, to consume excessive amounts of alcohol which causes hypertension, stroke, liver disease, and an assortment of cancers. Another cultural argument is the argument that the foods that comprise the cultural repertoire of soul food, foods that Black Americans are believed to eat because it is part of our culture, these are the sugary, high-fat, high-sodium foods that lead to obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. The problem is that it is misleading to conclude that when people of color engage in unhealthy behaviors, it is because their culture made them do it. It is misleading because the reality is that oftentimes the lives of people of color have been constrained in ways that make unhealthy behaviors the only option. In other words, the health behaviors of people of color may not be cultural in the usual sense of the term. If some people of color do not go to the doctor as often as they should, it is likely because they are uninsured or, don't, or there are no health providers accessible to them. Or it might be because they had an interaction with a health provider that made them lose trust in, in, in the healthcare system. And so we don't need to rely on the Tuskegee experiment from the 1920s to explain Black people's distrust of health providers. If some people of color drink alcohol to excess, it may be because they are coping with poverty and racism. If some people of color eat foods that are high in fat, salt, and sugar, it may be due to those foods being the only affordable options in their neighborhoods. I like to remind people that it's called the dollar menu. McDonald's has a dollar menu. The foods on that menu cost a dollar, which means you can get a burger, fries, soda, and probably something sweet for $4. See how far $4 gets you at Whole Foods. See how far $4 gets you at the Berkeley Bowl. <laughs> and then there are the droves of studies that show that behavioral differences cannot explain racial disparities in health. One scholar summarized the literature succinctly when he wrote, as observed 10 years ago, health behaviors can be potent contributors to disease risk. There is little evidence, however, that alone or in combination, health behaviors can explain racial and ethnic health disparities. So identifying genes and culture as the causes of racial disparities in health represents a commitment not to take systemic racism seriously. 
But if I'm completely honest with you guys, I will admit that genetic and cultural explanations of racial disparities in health um, actually are not the most popular theories offered to explain why people of color are sicker and die earlier than their white counterparts. In fact, the most popular explanation of racial disparities in health today is likely the fact of implicit bias. However, there are significant limitations to this theory. And first I'll describe the literature on implicit bias, and then I'll discuss its weaknesses. But before I launch into that, I just wanna note that a lot of critical race theorists um, have looked into implicit bias. A lot of critical race theorists um, have examined how implicit bias plays out in the health context, in the policing context, in employment context, in admissions context. So which is to say a lot of critical race theorists have dedicated their lives and their scholarship to exploring how implicit bias operates. And then there are other critical race theorists who have critiqued um, the literature on implicit bias and they have articulated the critique that I'm going to share with you, which is to say critical race theory isn't a cult. <laughs> it is not a unified or it's not a, a, a theory within which everyone disagrees, there, uh, within which everyone agrees. There is an incredible amount of disagreement and contention and conversation and dialogue among critical race theory. So when someone offers to say critical race theory is this X, Y, Z, um, it's likely ignoring the heterogeneity, um, the contestation and the fluidity that exists within the theory. So. With that in mind, implicit bias. In 2005, the Institute of Medicine or the IOM, which is now a different division, but they released a report documenting that people of color receive lower quality health care than white people, even when you control for all the things that might explain differences in care, like insurance status, like income, like age, like severity of the conditions. And the IOM reported that racial minorities are less likely than white people to be given appropriate cardiac care, to receive kidney dialysis or transplants, and to receive the best treatments for stroke, cancer, or AIDS. The IOM concluded by describing what they said was an uncomfortable reality. Some people in the United States are more likely to die from cancer, heart disease, and diabetes simply because of their race or ethnicity, not just because they lack access to health care. Many studies have buttressed the IOM's findings by documenting that providers are less likely to prescribe and deliver effective treatments to people of color when compared to their white counterparts, even after controlling for all those important characteristics like class. Most researchers have explained the reality that providers give inferior care to their patients of color by looking to implicit biases. The idea is that Providers have views about racial minorities of which they are not consciously aware, and these are views that lead them to make unintentional and ultimately harmful judgments about the care that they give people of color, the care that they give people of color. Many of you are familiar with the implicit association test, and this is a test that purports to measure test takers' implicit biases by asking them to link images of black and white faces with pleasant and unpleasant words under intense time constraints. Now, when physicians are given the IAT, they tend to associate white faces and pleasant words much more easily than they can associate black faces and pleasant words. In fact, research shows that these anti-black pro-white implicit biases are as prevalent among providers as they are among the general population, which is to say there is nothing about medical school that cleanses individuals of the implicit biases that exist in society more generally. Further, there is research that purports to show that providers' implicit biases um, actually impact the health care that they give, right? It's one thing to have an implicit bias. It's another thing to actually act on the implicit bias. And this research shows that providers are acting on their implicit bias. For example, one study showed that physicians whose implicit association tests revealed them to harbor pro-white implicit biases were more likely to prescribe pain medications to white patients than to black patients. Another study administered the IAT to physicians and then asked them whether they would prescribe thrombolysis, which is an aggressive yet effective treatment for coronary artery disease. Keep in mind that was the disease that George Floyd had when he died. 
so this this uh, this uh, study asked physicians to whether they were prescribed this treatment for coronary artery disease to patients presenting with a range of symptoms for the disease. And this experiment revealed that physicians whom the IAT test revealed to harbor anti-Black implicit biases were less likely to prescribe dermbolysis to Black patients and more likely to prescribe that same treatment to white patients. So if these studies are up to something, then implicit biases might be contributing to racial disparities in health. When observers, including the media, as well as medical schools, talk about racial disparities in health, this is the focus that they tend to have. The focus is on implicit bias. Sort of at the beginning of the coronavirus co co tragedy in the US, um, I was asked to speak um, on New York Public Radio about racial disparities in, maternal, in, in mortality from COVID-19. And that is precisely what they wanted to talk about. They wanted me to talk about implicit biases and how implicit biases might be contributing to disparities in COVID-19 mortality rates between Black people and white people. And then for their part, medical schools, um, when they address racial disparities in health, they tend to focus on implicit biases. Some medical schools even go so far as to give their students an IAT so that the students know that they have implicit biases and the extent of them. And then these programs tell students and residents, you know, to be mindful about how their documented implicit biases may influence the health care that they give. And to be honest, that is incredibly laudable. But the issue is that racial disparities in health cannot be explained entirely in terms of implicit bias. That is, the fact that providers have implicit bias is an incomplete explanation of racial disparities of, in health. Implicit bias has to be put in conversation with systemic racism. It has to be put in conversation with institutional and structural racism. And so in the balance of my remarks, which is about 10 more minutes, I will discuss the analytical limitations of the field of implicit bias. And then I will ask the question, what do we see when we put implicit bias in conversation with institutional and structural racism. First, the field of implicit bias is limited on its own terms. The field is focused on the individual and the prejudices and aversions that he or she may or may not possess. And then note how this focus is a piece with the definition of racism posited by traditional civil rights discourse, right? Racism as discrete, easily identifiable, invariably intentional, always irrational acts that are perpetrated by bad actors. Essentially, traditional civil rights discourse posits that racism is what happens when racist individuals think racist thoughts and then do racist things. Implicit bias essentially says the same thing, right? It essentially says that we're talking about discrete, identifiable, and it's not intentional, it's unintentional, but they are irrational acts that are perpetrated by bad actors. So critical race theorists and progressive theorists of race have fought tooth and nail to challenge this narrow formulation of racism. Again, we posit that in the post-civil rights era, racism is what, it's better defined as what happens when institutions and structures operate in a race neutral manner that nevertheless perpetuates historical disadvantage and produces new forms of racial disenfranchisement. Nevertheless, implicit bias remains squarely in this individual-centered paradigm. And this individual-centered par uh, paradigm causes us to think of racism as a private concern, which might mitigate any responsibility that the state and society more generally might have for the eradication of racism and racial inequality. So we might be skeptical of implicit bias research because it might commit the error that non-critical thinkers of race make. It might be focused on individualist racism, and it might be ignoring institutional and structural racism. Further, there is an argument to be made that the problem is not that individuals have implicit biases. Instead, the problem is that we have constructed a society wherein people of color are at the bottom of most measures of social well-being. 
People of color more frequently bear the burdens of poverty than white people. People of color are incarcerated more than white people. People of color are confined in immigrant detention centers more than white people. People of color rely on the social safety net more than white people. People of color are unemployed more frequently than white people. People of color die violent deaths more frequently than white people. And it is doubtful that implicit biases alone can explain these disturbing inequalities. More likely, the reverse is true. These inequalities explain implicit biases. And for that reason, critical race theorists have argued that the best approach to dealing with implicit bias is through a sustained process of social change that results in the elimination of the socially disfavored status of the subordinated group. If people of color were not invariably located at the bottom of social hierarchies, providers likely would not have negative implicit biases about them. But perhaps more importantly, the field of implicit bias needs to be put in conversation with structural racism. And what would we see if we paid attention to structural racism? Well, we would see that individuals with implicit biases, as well as individuals without implicit biases, they are all practicing medicine within a two-tiered healthcare system. And this is a system that allows for the privately insured who are disproportionately white to access healthcare that is simply better than the publicly insured, not to mention the uninsured. And to make this point as tangibly as possible, I will tell you a bit about my first book. Reproducing Race is an ethnography of the obstetrics clinic of a public hospital in Manhattan. I call the hospital Alpha, just to give it some anonymity. An Alpha hospital is a good hospital. It is world renowned for its research and innovation. However, these achievements do not exempt it from its status as a public hospital. Alpha must still depend on government dollars, which are always in short supply. And the result is that Alpha is plagued by problems that visit many public institutions. It is underfunded and understaffed. Moreover, the equipment that the staff and the physicians use may be in short supply or may have been superseded by newer, better versions, versions that are outside of the hospital's fiscal reach due to budget constraints. And this is a long quote from um, a chief resident. And the chief resident was just explaining to me the difference between Alpha and Omega. Omega is the private hospital that literally sits right next door to Alpha. Now, Omega doesn't take Medicaid. Um, so all of Omega's patients are privately insured. And which, what that means is that Omega gets more money per patient because private insurance is reimbursed at rates that are twice to three times the rates at which Medicaid reimbursed. So Alpha just has more money. Also note that because Alpha doesn't have, doesn't take uh, public insurance, doesn't take Medicaid, you have this strict dichotomy of populations. The poor patients go to Alpha and the more affluent patients go to Omega. And what this quote is explaining is that when you're in Omega, you're likely to be able to um, have better scans because the equipment in Omega is better than Alpha. Your ability to have a scan, an MRI, a CAT scan, what have you, um, it's just the amount of time that you have to wait is going to be shorter because Omega has more of the equipment than Alpha Hospital. Um, and then there's a part of this quote which says that, you know, we might just, we might do a scan at Alpha on this old equipment and we'll call it a poor study. We won't know what to do with, you know, we can't make any conclusions based on this scan because of the quality of the machine. Meanwhile, at Omega, you'll never have a poor study, um, which means that if you're an Omega, your healthcare that you're receiving is just going to be superior. Which is to say, individuals with implicit biases as well as individuals without implicit biases are practicing medicine within the inequalities enabled by the country's two-tiered uh, healthcare system. So I repeat, implicit bias as a theory of racial disparities in health is radically incomplete. And finally, let us not forget the social determinants of health for the uninitiated. The social determinants of health are the conditions under which people live that affect their health. Critical scholars are committed to the idea that these structural factors, the availability of healthcare, quality schools, non-hazardous jobs, safe and secure housing, non-violent, unpolluted cities and communities, et cetera, 
these structural factors go a long way towards explaining the poor health that people of color have. There are studies too numerous to count that document that the environments in which min racial minorities live, work, play, and age are all likely to compromise their health. And it is important to underscore that there is nothing inevitable about the fact that people of color inhabit the most polluted environments. There is nothing inevitable about the fact that people of color inhabit these environments while also lacking the means like health insurance to protect their health. The World Health Organization's position on this issue is compelling. The unequal distribution of health damaging experiences is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but as a result of a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. So sure, implicit biases harbored by medical providers may be impacting the health care that they give patients of color, but the society in which patients of color are living, that is what's doing most of the heavy lifting when it comes to shortening and reducing the quality of their lives. So I will end there. Um, I will conclude just by saying that I'm so glad that so many have protested George Floyd's death. I'm so glad that so many have protested Breonna Taylor's death. And I'm so glad that so many continue to protest these deaths. But I hope that we keep in mind that what protesters are protesting, it's bigger than Derek Chauvin. It's bigger than the Minneapolis Police Department. It's bigger than the Louisville Police Department. It's bigger than policing. It is bigger than the criminal legal system as a whole. I take their protests to be protests of a racial order of things that have found that it's found a number of different ways to shorten and end black people's lives. And with that, I am done. <laughs> and I look forward to the conversation. I, Professor Kiara Bridges, thank you very, very much. Um, we are in your debt for <laughs> such a comprehensive um, and sort of deep analysis. Um, and thank you for, for really explaining the critical race theory. Um, the questions that emerged, the first five questions were not questions, they were just um, a shower <laughs> of appreciation. Um, and, I, and obviously contained within that was the question, how else uh, can people share your presentation? And so I just want to take a moment to tell people that um, our classroom team, Rob and, and Max, will be posting this on YouTube um, probably sometime on Monday. And so that will be available through the, um, the OLLI website. And please do share it, do talk about it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the first question. Um, and Part of it is when we see how woefully inadequate the civil rights definition is, is there any hope or belief that the International Human Rights Declaration that the UN has put together, would it be better um, you know, for us to begin to use that um, as a kind of rubric and guide um, and so are, are you familiar with the International Human Rights Declaration? I, I am, but it might be helpful for you to share, um, share the, um, the definition with the audience so that they are familiar as well. Um, you know, what I think I will do is there is, I know there's someone in our crowd right now who's worked a lot on the international human rights. Um, Rita Marin is, is with us today. Um, and has taught courses on international human rights, which I think covers the whole span of the things that we were just bringing, you were bringing up around housing and healthcare, mm -hmm. you know, sort of life, liberty, <laughs> and the yeah, pursuit yeah. of happiness, um, right to education, um, all of that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, I think since it's something that we're trying to cultivate within international law, might it not also guide us right. on, on some things as well? Yeah, so, um, so I will um, just 
offer that, you know, the inter international human rights framework is much more comprehensive than any framework that the U.S. has ever embraced. Um, for example, um, there are rights to be freedom, um, uh, to be free from discrimination on the basis of culture, race, sex, um, the rights to uh, clean air, water, um, the right to be free from uh, discrimination on the basis of religion, etc. Um, and so the international human rights framework tends to be much more expansive and comprehensive um, than the framework that we embrace in our anti-discrimination law in the U.S. One thing that I want to highlight is the distinction between negative rights and positive rights. Um, and so in the US, we tend to embrace, or rather our constitution has been interpreted to protect only negative rights, which is the right to be free uh, from government intervention. So the government cannot go in your home and take food out of your, uh, out of your refrigerator, and the government cannot go in your home um, and, and take your prescription medications out of your, um, of your bathroom cabinet. Positive rights are different. And positive rights are, are much more recognized um, in international human rights uh, treaties and instruments. Positive rights are rights to government um, assistance. Um, and so a positive right to food would mean, a negative right to food means that the government can come in and take the food out of your refrigerator, but a positive right to food means that the government has to make sure that you have food to eat. Um, and a, a negative right to uh, freedom from uh, having the government take your prescription medication means that the government can come in and take your prescription medications. But a positive right to health means that the government has to provide you with the tools that you need in order to be healthy. International human rights treaties and instruments protect positive rights. The U.S. Constitution, as I mentioned already, um, has, has, uh, has been interpreted to protect only negative rights, which leads us to a present state of, of our laws, um, which is that you have no recourse when you don't have the basic necessities that one needs. You have no recourse. There are no rights. You can't sue because you lack food clothing, shelter, health care. And so, yes, international human rights would be a wonderful um, regime for interpreting um, the rights that we, rec that we recognize in our constitution, as well as the rights that we, you know, that have been provided in statutes like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for example. The problem <laughs> is that the Supreme Court has been very clear, um, starting around about the 1970s, that the Constitution does not protect positive rights, but also that we ought not to look to international human rights treaties to interpret our Constitution. <laughs> the, the late Justice Scalia um, wrote vigorous dissents <laughs> whenever a majority of the Supreme Court even looked over to international human rights treaties um, to, in, you know, to interpret what our Constitution protects. Um, he dissented vigorously on a number of occasions whenever any sort of overtures were made towards looking at international human rights treaties. So, mm -hmm. which is to say there is an idea of American exceptionalism, that America is so unique, um, that our Constitution is so distinct from any other legal instrument, um, that we ought to be insular and myopic when it comes to interpreting what that document provides. Thank so you. We, would, we would be in much better, but much better uh, hands, or we would be in a better situation if we actually look to other outside bodies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that response. A um, couple of questions uh, to get in. Is, does the um, Obamacare or ACA, does that have, has that had any impact on um, inequities? So the, the, so, Oh, the Affordable Care Act is going to um, address some racial disparities in health in as much as some of the uh, cause of racial disparities in health is inaccessible, you know, the inaccessibility of health care. So to the extent that individuals can access health care through the Affordable Care Act, um, then they will um, be able to protect their health and racial disparities in health will be uh, eliminated to some or to limit it in some um, extent. To some extent, the issue is that uh, states were given the option to expand <laughs> Medicaid, uh, Medicaid or not um, through uh, NI, 
NFIB versus Sebelius, um, the Supreme Court case that initially upheld the constitutionality of, afford of the Affordable Care Act. And so it was, we called it the red state option. Um, so states were given the option to expand Medicaid mm -hmm. or not. It just so happened that the states that chose not to expand Medicaid were the, Medicaid were the states um, that had large numbers of Black people. <laughs> so um, in as much as, you know, Black people disproportionately um, lack health care, if they're stuck in these states that chose not to, uh, to expand um, Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act, then mm -hmm. uh, the Affordable Care Act would not have worked to um, ameliorate at least that obstacle towards achieving the health that their white counterparts have. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, an earlier question that came in that I kind of want to qualify as maybe an evolutionary biology question. Mm -hmm. which, um, and I will, I, let me just preface it that uh, one of the things that I think people have been noting is the, uh, the low death rate um, around COVID-19 in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, even how many people are infected and then what the what the fatality or mortality rate is there. So <laughs> I have that in mind as I pose this question to you, which is by one of the members who said, if if in fact racism has become so ingrained in our psyches and perhaps influencing our DNA, mm -hmm. is there not some basis? around the fact that there is um, now a genetic um, set of issues that are emerging. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, so that's act, that question um, calls up and invites me to explain epigenetics. Um, so epigenetics is a field of, of research um, that looks into how environments can impact the expression of genes. So again, we're not talking about how environments cause genetic mutations, but rather how environments cause different aspects of the genes to be expressed. So this is the difference between genotype and phenotype. Phenotype is the expression of genes. The reality is that environments can influence the, the, the expression of genes. And moreover, those different uh, genetic expressions um, can be passed down from generation to generation. And so the way that I like to describe it is that my grandmother grew up in the Jim Crow South. Um, she was a maid in the Jim Crow South. The Jim Crow South impacted, um, being a Black person in the Jim Crow South and a maid impacted the expression of her genes, which likely contributed to the fact that she died of a heart attack um, at a relatively young age. When she had her child, which is my mother, and my mother had me, I have inherited my grandmother's um, expression of her genes. Um, which is to say, I've inherited this disadvantage. So it's kind of like part of me, although I have a great job at the University of Berkeley and a law school, um, and I have great health care, I have inherited that disadvantage in the way that my genes have expressed. The hope, of course, is that two generations out, my child and my child's child, they can now live the environment that I have lived, which is one that is, is of relative privilege. So the question that was posed is getting at the field of epigenetics. Um, and I think the field of epigenetics is actually, I do know that the field of epigenetics is incredibly interesting to researchers because it can explain some of the, the, some portion of racial disparities in health. But I think it's important to recognize that as environments change genetic expressions, environments can unchange uh, genetic expressions. Um, and so epigenetics should not be a call for abdicating responsibility. Like, ah, uh, it's in the genes, what can we do? Let's move on to other things like, I don't know, mm -hmm. other things. But rather mm -hmm. epigenetics is a call for us to create environments um, that impact genetic expression in healthful ways so that future generations can be healthy. Uh, thank you for that response. And it sort of, I guess, <laughs> it asks um, uh, for all of us to have much more dialog dialectical thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one thing I would just add to, to that answer is that, you know, I, I rely on Dorothy Roberts' um, research and much of my scholarship because she's brilliant, but she has, um, she offers that race is not 
a biological concept with um, political consequences, whether it's a political concept with biological consequences. So there's no denying, right? My, my, my father has hypertension, right? Um, there's no denying that being black in this country means that you have a greater likelihood of just dying earlier and being sicker, but it's not because it's in the genes, but rather because this is a political con a construct that is killing us, literally is impacting our biological processes and maybe even our genetic ex expression of our genes. Is there, um, it, as a sort of question to close with, is there in this so-called political moment that we have um, with so many more people mobilized and aware around racial injustice, is there some, are there particular areas that you're feeling more hopeful? I'm feeling hopeful um, that, so, you know, critical race theory has been talking about these issues since, you know, the 1970s. Um, and what I'm hopeful about is that our, the conversations that we have been having, the insights that we have generated um, are no longer confined to the legal academy. They're no longer confined to, you know, books that are in somebody's library and nobody pulls down. It's no longer confined to law reviews. Rather, um, these ideas, the concept of structural racism, um, these ideas have, have traveled beyond, you know, the ivory tower. And so I am, I am hopeful that this is an opportunity to, um, for people to be interested, for people to learn more about um, racial inequality, um, and for people's ideas around racism and, ra and racial inequality and racial subordination to become more nuanced. But I have to say that it's, it's, it has to be more than a moment. It has to be a sustained event. Um, and so I hope that, you know, when 2020 comes to an end, it can't come to an end <laughs> quick enough, but when 2020 comes to an end and we begin 2021, um, that we stay interested in these issues because they're not going to go anywhere. Um, simply because we turn our back to them won't mean that, you know, that policing won't be dangerous and that the, you know, the next novel coronavirus won't kill people of color um, at greater rates. Um, these issues aren't going away. So we ought to uh, remain uh, focused and interested in them. Professor Bridges, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you for contributing <laughs> to this hopefulness and to this constant education and um, going, going beyond uh, where we are right now as quickly as we can. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my work with your, your community. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Have a good weekend, everybody. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.